This is a fan-generated show. If you would like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com and also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Hi, this is the Daniel Greenfield moment on the Glazov gang. Um, instead of Jamie Glazov, you'll have to put up with me right now. And we're going to talk about um, the Burkini ban in France and really why the Burkini, which seems like a whole silly discussion, is actually a danger to women. Um, the media found its way to civil rights cause in the Burkini. It's not the plight of Christians in Muslim countries who can't come here. Um, it's, not the, um, it's not the murder of terrorist, the Muslim terrorist attacks in Europe. It's, instead, it's all about the um, tragic plight of the Burkini. Um, what is the Burkini? The Burkini is a portmanteau of burqa, which is the all-encompassing cloth prison inflicted on women in Afghanistan by the Taliban, and the Burkini, which was banned in France along with its parent, the burqa, which was also banned. Now, to Americans, this kind of ban may seem auto baffling. Um, the media certainly has played it up uh, quite a bit in order to stir up sympathy. Now, does it actually matter what women, Muslim women wear to the beach? Now, arguably, certainly from an American standpoint, the government should not be getting involved in swimwear, Muslims or otherwise. But the thing to understand is that Islam is very much a political ideology rather than something private or personal. And so uh, it is very much a political statement and it's beyond of safety implications. Because the clothing of Muslim women is not a personal fashion choice. Muslim women don't wear hijabs, burqas or any other similar garb. As a fashion statement, even an expression of religious piety, their own religion tells us exactly why they wear them. And it says straightforwardly in the Quran, and I'm quoting the Quran here, O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers to draw their cloaks over their bodies so that they may be distinguished, and this is the key part, and not molested. It's not about modesty, it's not about religion. It's about putting a do not rape sign on Muslim women and putting a, conversely, a freedom molest sign on non-Muslim women. Uh, the... Quran was very specifically putting forward the burqa and the various the hijab, the various incarnations of it, as a way to distinguish for Muslim men to distinguish between Muslim women who were not to be touched and non-Muslim women who could be touched. That's the plain and simple understanding of it. And it's not some paranoid misreading of Islamic scripture or Islamic commentaries use synonyms for molested, such as harmed, assaulted, and attacked uh, for these women who aren't wearing their burqas. This is again pretty straightforward. Uh, women who aren't wearing burqas aren't decent women. They can be expected to be assaulted by Muslim men. These quotes designate Muslim women as believing women or women of the believers. And again, I'm quoting. That is to say, these are Muslim women. And there's a distinction between Muslim women who should not be molested and non-Muslim women who can be molested. And there's one Quranic commentary which is quite explicit. It is more likely that this way they may be recognized, again, I'm quoting, as pious, free women and may not be hurt, considered by mistake as roving slave girls. And if you want an example of roving slave girls, which seems an antiquated notion, until ISIS came along and actually you had the uh, captivity of the ISIS girls, the ISIS women, uh, ISIS ch um, Yazidi girls, Yazidi women, some even uh, really young girls, and they were considered slave girls by their Muslim captors. Uh, so this was uh, in Muhammad's uh, time, you had uh, these encampments, and there would be Muslim women in them, and these Muslim women would be covered with burqas, and there would be non-Muslim women in there, and those would be captive women. These women would, could then be recognized because they're not covered in burqas, they could be assaulted by Muslim men. And this is something that's not just antiquated, it's something that's happening today in ISIS camps, but it's also something that's happening in major cities in Europe. So the idea is that Muslim women who don't want to be mistaken for non-Muslim slave girls had better cover up, and non-Muslim women had better cover up too, or they'll be treated the way that ISIS treated Yazidi women, and the way that Muhammad and his gang of rapists and bandits treated any woman that they came across. That's what the, what the burqa is, that's what the hijab is, and that's what the burkini is. And it's not just some relic of the past or horror practiced by so-called Islamic extremists or radical Islamists or radical jihadists, as if they're a moderate jihadist. It's ubiquitous. So there was a French survey about a decade ago, 15 years ago, that found that 77% of girls wore the hijab because of threats of Islamist violence. Now, if you understand numbers like these, you also understand why the French banned the burqa. It's why they banned the burkini now. When clothing becomes a license to encourage harassment of other people, it's no longer a private choice. Muslim women wearing a burqa or a hijab or a burkini are pointing a sign at other women. The sign says, harass those women instead. 
It's not modesty. It's the way that Muslim women choose to function as an instrument of Muslim violence against non-Muslim women. And this is a very fundamental point because, again, you're seeing what happened in Cologne, what happened in Germany, where 2,000 Muslim attackers attacked 1,200 women in a single night. And this is still ongoing. Uh, you're seeing this in the UK with the sex grooming scandals. So for uh, Muslim women, this is something. This is a kind of a defense mechanism. It says, don't attack us, attack those other women, attack those non-Muslim women. In some cases, they will say it straight out. But their code actually says it for them. In the Islamic worldview, it's important to understand this also, sexual violence is the fault of the victim, not of the perpetrator. It's the fact that the assault approves the guilt of the child of the woman who was attacked. Uh, the Grand Mufti of Australia, after a series of Sydney gang rapes of Muslim men by not... Uh, carried out by Muslim men of non-Muslim women said, and I quote again, if you take uncovered meat and put it on the street, on the pavement, in a garden, in a park, or in the backyard without a cover, and the cats eat it, is it the fault of the cat or the uncovered meat? The uncovered meat is the problem. If she was in a room, in her home, and this is the key, in her hijab, no problem would have occurred, he said. This, is the grand, this was the Grand Mufti of Australia at the time. So this is the fundamental idea. It says that if she's not wearing a hijab, then it's okay to attack her. Then, they're, they're, then it's her fault that she was attacked. And this is, again, the Islamic worldview. It's the, really what Muslim immigrants are bringing into Western countries. And again, this is why there's a burqa ban and a burkini ban. It's why there should be a hijab ban. The existence of these garments gives license to Muslim women, men to target non-Muslim women. They allow Islamists to impose them as a standard by singling out women who don't wear them for attack. And they encourage Muslim men to carry out assaults on non-Muslim women who do not comply with Islamic law. That is what France has rejected. It's what every country that respects the right of women to be free from being molested by the believers, quote unquote, who get their morality from Muhammad, a serial rapist and pedophile from whom no woman, including his own son's wife, was safe or to reject. The media chose to be deeply outraged by France's ban of the burqa and the burkini. It doesn't seem especially interested in the fact that Saudi Arabia forces women to wear the abaya, a covering that's not too different from the burqa, or that Sudan's Islamist regime arrested Christian women in front of a church for wearing pants and threatened to cane them. It's not that the left feels that women ought to be able to wear whatever they want in other countries. Certainly not non-Muslim women in Muslim countries. But that it believes that Muslims ought to be able to do whatever they want, whether it's impose dress codes at home, resist dress codes abroad, or even impose dress codes abroad. And the first target of these dress codes are inevitably women. Islam expands through violence. It imposes its standards through violence. Before the, bur the ban, the burkini must affect the burqa had already come to be associated with violent classes. Clashes. In one such incident in France, a man was shot with a harpoon. That's a pretty ugly event. So it's not surprising that the French have grown tired of this. The burkini ban like the burqa ban is understandable, but it's not a final answer. The final answer is, of course, to address the question of Muslim immigration, to address the growth of Islam in Western countries, and to have a serious and honest and open conversation about the effects of the growth of Islam on women. Um, banning the burkini, banning the burqa is swapping a bandit on a problem. It covers up some of the worst symptoms, but it doesn't address the key issue, and the key issue is Islam. Thank you very much for listening. Um, this has been uh, yet another video put out by the Glazov Gang. If you'd like to support the Glazov Gang, subscribe to its YouTube channel. Um, like it on Facebook, uh, follow Jamie Glazov, um, who is a really smart and brilliant guy, um, and see what you can do to support commentary like this. Thank you very much once again, and have a good night.